Dr. Foner, if you don't mind, if you would turn your body slightly and then scoot in a little bit. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the most historic room in the state of Mississippi. In this room on January 7, 1861, delegates voted to secede from the Union. More to the point, in this room on January 20, 1870, the Mississippi legislature elected Hiram Rhodes Revels to the United States Senate. He was the first African American elected to the U.S. Congress and it is that momentous event that we gather to celebrate tonight. We're grateful to all of you for joining us, and we're deeply honored to have one of the nation's most distinguished historians, Eric Foner, as our keynote speaker. 
We're really thrilled to have Revel's descendants, and I, I'll ask you to stand when I call your names, please. Uh, Harold Woodson, Charles Woodson, they came from San Francisco because Marcus Ward persuaded them to come. Thank you, Marcus. And Melissa Walden, who came from Florida. We also have Dabney Coors, great-great-granddaughter of James L. Alcorn, who came from Memphis. As we were planning this event with Stuart Rockoff and our friends at the Mississippi Humanities Council, we reached out to other organizations to join us in celebrating Hiram Revels. Uh, and we were thrilled by the response. With us tonight are groups from Alcorn State University. Y'all feel free to stand when I, when I call your uh, affiliations. Uh, where Hiram Revels became the first president in 1871 from Zion Chapel AME Church in Natchez, where Revels was the pastor, from the city of Natchez, which is working to establish Revels Plaza in front of Zion Chapel AME Church, and from the Hiram Revels Masonic Lodge in Natchez. All right. Representative Robert Johnson will present a proclamation from the Mississippi legislature tonight, and Senator Roger Wicker will be introducing a proclamation in the United States Senate. Is Mike Espy still here? Mike Espy was the first African American from Mississippi elected to Congress since Reconstruction. Thank you for being here tonight. We're really proud to be part of such a broad-based uh, recognition of Revel's accomplishments and celebration of this uh, important anniversary. Uh, I, I want to just briefly thank Lauren Rogers, uh, director of the Old Capitol and the Old Capitol staff, Brother Rogers, Michael Morris, and all the MDAH staff who put this event together. It was a lot of fun for all of us. And now I'm honored to present Alcorn State University President, Dr. Felicia M. Nave, to give remarks. Thank you. And thank you all very much for the warm welcome. Good evening to everyone. What a wonderful evening, and it's so nice to see you all despite the weather that is outside. To our distinguished elected officials, Dr. Eric Fawner, welcome. The Department of Archives Director, Katie Blount. Pastor Burden Mitchell, two museum directors, Pam Jr., our fellow co-sponsor, the Mississippi Humanities Council. Other guests, members of the Revels and Alcorn families, Alconites, and friends, thank you for being here and for allowing Alcorn State University an opportunity to share in this most noteworthy celebration in honor of our founding president. This is a great day in Mississippi history, a significant day for Alcorn, and I might add, a proud day for my predecessors and our community. As the 20th and first female president of the oldest HBCU land grant in the nation, the first institution established by the state of Mississippi for the higher education of African Americans, it is even more notable that we commemorate this day in this month, Black History Month. What an exciting month it has been for Alcorn. Who would have thought a little black girl from the Ramsey community of Jefferson Davis County, Mississippi, would one day be able to attend, graduate from, and eventually return to serve as the president for the very institution named for a former Confederate officer and post-Civil War governor, James L. Alcorn, and where an eloquent, moderating, and unifying voice from the same period, Hiram Revels, began a long golden line of leaders. The paradox of the university's founding in history is not lost on us today. We owe a great deal of gratitude 
to the vision and foresight of our political forefathers. And to top it all off, within this same week, last Tuesday and today, I've had the distinct privilege to address legislators and fellow citizens from both the floor of the new Mississippi Capitol Building and tonight in this hallowed hall, the old state Capitol Building. What a blessing and an honor. This sequence of events appears particularly poignant Yet we know providence makes no mistakes. They say prayer changes things. Having honed his speaking skills as a traveling minister prior to the great war between the states, Hiram Rose Revels became well known around the nation from Ohio to Baltimore to Vicksburg as a gifted orator. After winning an election to represent Adams County in the Mississippi Senate, fate would have it for him to deliver the opening prayer to start the session. It was a prayer so moving that it left the entire State House awestruck. John R. Lynch himself, a fellow freedman and Natch Natchez, Natchez, I'm still working on that one, <laughs> would later write it was that one of the most impressive and eloquent prayers that have ever been delivered in the Senate chamber made Revels a United States Senator. It was impressed, the, it impressed those who heard it that Revels was not only a man of great natural ability, but he was also a man of superior attainment. It is fitting that we sit here tonight in the very building where 150 years ago this year, that Mississippi legislator filled with the majority of men who only five years earlier were in bondage and considered subservient and unequal to their fellow lawmakers would cast votes to reconstruct a civil government and officially admit the state back into the union of the United States of America. And so it was that on January the 20th, 1870, they electrified Mississippi and sent shockwaves around the world by electing the first African American to the United States Senate. At 4.40 p.m. on Friday, February 25th, 1870, their action would be confirmed. 149 years, 11 months, and 14 days from today, a 43-year-old man, born free of African and Native American heritage, who many of his new colleagues less than 72 hours previously had argued was not a citizen of his birth nation, would take his seat and usher in a new era in American politics and set the nation on a roller coaster course in societal relations. I hearken back to those two ingredients that Lynch attributed to Revels natural ability and superior attainments. That earned him the respect of his Mississippi colleagues and the nation. These attributes remind us of the university's marketing tagline where knowledge and character matter. I believe the natural ability and superior attainments of Hiram Revels have transcended time and became, become the defining qualities of Alcorn and her alumni for over 148 years. Tonight's program is another opportunity to continue highlighting of Alcorn's significant contributions and place in Mississippi, America, and world history. Again, on behalf of Alcorn State University, we thank the Mississippi Humanities Council, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History Board and staff for all of your assistance and support over the years and for including the university in tonight's celebration. We look forward to everyone enjoying an extraordinary, informative lecture from Dr. Forner this evening. Thank you very much. God bless. Go Alcorn State University. Thank you, President Nave. I did notice some uh, Archives and History employees wearing their Alcorn gear to make you feel at home. Um, 
Now please welcome Representative Robert Johnson of Natchez to present a proclamation. Thank you. It is a great honor, and it, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that my family has been at Zion Chapel for over four generations, and it was, it's a proud moment for me. The other thing that's significant is that I was elected to the state senate in 1992 and became the second African-American senator from Adams County after Hiram Revels. And I would like to say that we have an opportunity to elect our first African-American senator from Mississippi, Mike Espin, so we want to, want to be a part of that right now. I hope that significance is not lost on us. I was proud that he was here. Uh, as, as prone as I am to love to hear myself speak, I won't give a lot. I won't say a lot tonight. I'll just give you the title of the resolution and let you know that the, it will be ratified on the floor of the House tomorrow. And I'll read the, uh, the ending. A resolution commemorating the life and legacy of the Honorable Hiram Rose Revels on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of his monumental 1870 election to the United States Senate as the first African American to serve in Congress and acknowledging the historical legacy of his election and accomplishments to the great state of Mississippi and the entire nation. And let it be known that be it resolved that by the House of Representatives of the state of Mississippi that we do hereby commemorate the life and legacy of the Honorable Hiram Rose Revels on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of his monumental 1870 election and to the United States Senate as the first African American to serve in Congress and acknowledge the historical legacy of his election and accomplishments to the great state of Mississippi and the entire nation. Be it further resolved, the copies of this resolution be furnished to the descendants of Mr. Rose, uh, Senator Rose and to the members of the Capitol Press Corps. Thank you all for having us. Good evening. I have to go off script just a little bit because I'm, I'm overwhelmed in being in this, uh, in this space, this space where Hiram Rose Revels stood, this place where John R. Lynch stood. Just take it in for just a moment. Good evening. My name is Pamela Jr. I'm the director of the two Mississippi museums. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, for the evening, Dr. Eric Foner. Dr. Foner is a DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University and is considered the nation's preeminent historian on Reconstruction, slavery, and 19th century America. Dr. Foner is also the older brother of the late Thomas Foner, a volunteer civil rights worker for the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project of 1964, whose collection of Freedom Summer papers are housed in our archives. Building on the foundations of intellectuals such as W.E. Du Bois, J.R. Lynch, and John Hope Franklin, Dr. Foner's scholarship of the Reconstruction era has paved the way for new approaches to social, political, and racial history in America. He is one of only two persons to serve as president of the Organization of American Historians, American Historical Association, and Society of American Historians. Dr. Foney is a Pulitzer Prize winning scholar and author of 26 books. Dr. Foner's most recent book, The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution, examines the history of the 13th 14th and 15th Amendments. His 1988 book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, was a groundbreaking survey that redefined the role of African Americans legislators during the Reconstruction period, such as Hiram Revels, who we are here to celebrate tonight. No one is more qualified to speak on Hiram Revels and Reconstruction. We are thrilled to have him with us on this historic occasion, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm, hearty Mississippi welcome to Dr. Eric Foner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here for this uh, historic evening and to celebrate uh, the election of Hiram Revels to the uh, U.S. Senate um, and to be here in Mississippi. Now, it is true that when Brother Rogers invited me to come, he promised that I would be able to escape the cold, <laughs> dreary winter of New York City to sunny and warm Jackson. But according to my phone, the, the temperature today is exactly the same in New York City as in Jackson. So um, nonetheless, I've enjoyed my brief visit very, very much. I, I've visited the two wonderful museums you have just here, uh, and I've met many uh, very fine uh, people. And I'm very glad that um, uh, my brother's name was mentioned, Tom, who uh, spent the summer of 1964 uh, here in Mississippi um, among the other very courageous people who were fighting to uh, make democracy real in this country. Well, everybody in the United States probably knows that in our two centuries or so of um, existence, Barack Obama has been the only African-American president. Less familiar is the fact that of the approximately 2,000 men and women who have served in the U.S. Senate since 1789, only 10 have been black. 10 out of 2,000, or one half of 1%, is a considerably worse ratio than one president out of 45. Of those 10, of course, uh, two, Hiram Revels and then Blanche K. Bruce, were elected from Mississippi during Reconstruction, the era that followed the Civil War. These numbers offer a stark reminder of the almost insurmountable barriers that have kept African Americans from the highest offices in this land. And they also remind us how unique a moment Reconstruction was in, our, uh, in the history of American democracy. This month, February uh, 2020, uh, appropriately Black History Month, uh, marks the 150th anniversary of two momentous events. On February 3rd, 1870, uh, Iowa became, uh, they knew how to count votes back then in <laughs> Iowa. Um, Iowa became the 28th state to ratify the 15th Amendment which prohibited denial of voting rights because of race, making the 15th Amendment part of the Constitution. Three weeks later, as you've heard, on February 25th, uh, Hiram Revels became the first African American to take a seat in Congress, either house. Later that year, Joseph Rainey of South Carolina became the first black member of the House of Representatives. Revels was elected to fill an unexpired term that had been vacant since Mississippi's secession from the Union in 1861. Um, he served for only one year. No senator could be expected to accomplish a great deal in one year uh, as a freshman senator. We could have wished for more activity in a virgin field for Negro talent, commented Frederick Douglass's newspaper the new national era when Revel's term concluded. But on the whole, we are content. The precedent itself was something. By the blacks, he was hailed, this is Douglas, by the blacks, he was hailed with joy as the harbinger of a better time and a brighter period for the black man and the nation. As this observation suggests, Revel's accomplished more as a symbol than as a legislator. One indication of his impact on public consciousness lies in the wide circulation of his pictorial image. These years saw the production of numerous lithographs celebrating the overthrow of slavery and the achievement by African Americans of equal civil and political rights. They generally depicted scenes of slavery and freedom along with likenesses of Abraham Lincoln and prominent black leaders, revels almost always among them. In addition, an engraving of a portrait of revels by the German-born artist Theodore Kaufmann was widely sold during and after Reconstruction, especially to black families. Frederick Douglass noted, 
He said that African Americans, quote, so often see ourselves described and painted as monkeys that we think it is a great piece of fortune to find an exception to this rule. The dignified portrait of rebels was on the wall of many, many black families in this post-Civil War era. Revel's election to the Senate would have been inconceivable without the advent in 1867 of what historians call radical reconstruction, when Congress required the former Confederate states, with the exception of Tennessee, to extend the right to vote to black men. At that time, most northern states, as well as the border slave states that had remained in the Union, um, still limited the voting to whites. In fact, it's ironic that African-American men in the South, the vast majority of them recently emancipated slaves, won the right to vote three years before most of them in the rest of the country. Black male suffrage in the South led directly to the election of the country's first black political officials. During Reconstruction, some 2,000 African-American men, by my estimate, occupied public offices, ranging from Mississippi's two U.S. senators to 14 members of the House of Representatives, hundreds elected to state constitutional conventions and legislatures, and numerous uh, sheriffs, city councilmen, magistrates, and many others. This was a remarkable experiment in biracial democracy, something virtually without precedent in world history up to that point. And it aroused intense opposition from adherents of white supremacy. It was met with violent assaults on black voters and officials by the Ku Klux Klan and similar organizations. Democrats, then the party of white nationalism, to use a modern phrase, also launched a highly organized campaign of vilification, fake news, we would call it today, um, portraying black voters as incapable of participating intelligently in political life and black officials as ignorant, corrupt, and unfit for public service. At the beginning of the 20th century, as the rights blacks had acquired in Reconstruction were being systematically stripped away, this political propaganda was given scholarly legitimacy by the nation's historians. Indeed, Reconstruction stands at a prime example of what we might call the politics of history. I mean, I don't mean whether the historian is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I'm, what I'm talking about is the way in which historical interpretation both reflects and helps to shape the politics of the time in which the historian is writing. For most of the 20th century, what we call the Dunning School, after my long ago predecessor, William Dunning, who taught Civil War history at Columbia University, um, the Dunning School dominated historical writing and popular thinking on Reconstruction. In that view, Reconstruction marked the lowest point in the saga of American democracy. This portrait reached, a, it was a time of corruption and misgovernment. This portrait reached a broad public in the film Birth of a Nation, which had its premiere in Woodrow Wilson's White House. One crucial scene in that film vividly demonstrates the so-called incapacity of black legislators. They sit with bare feet propped on their desks, swigging whiskey, munching on chicken bones, and lasciviously eyeing white women in the galleries. As late as 1947, the University of Georgia historian E. Merton Coulter, a former president of the Southern Historical Association, described black office holding in Reconstruction as, quote, the most spectacular and exotic development in government in the history of white civilization, the longest to be remembered, shuddered at, and execrated. The Dunning School has long since been repudiated by professional historians, although its outlook survives to this day in some corners of popular historical consciousness. But it enjoyed a remarkable longevity, which can be explained by the fact that it harmonized with the racial system of the United States from around 1900 until the civil rights era of the 1960s, because the political lesson of this interpretation of history was very clear. 
It was a mistake to give black people the right to vote and hold office. Therefore, the white South was correct, legitimated, when it later took those rights away. As Gunnar Myrdal noted in his influential 1944 book, An American Dilemma, when confronted with demands for change in the racial system, white Southerners, quote, will regularly bring forward the horrors of the Reconstruction governments. That was the trump card if you said that African Americans should enjoy the same rights as anybody else in the South. When the Civil Rights Revolution took place, the pillars of this old interpretation, especially its overt racism, fell to the ground and Reconstruction was completely reinterpreted. Today, most historians see it as a noble, if ultimately unsuccessful, effort to establish for the first time in American history an interracial democracy, a precursor of the modern civil rights movement, which was sometimes called the Second Reconstruction. If the era was tragic, we now think, it was not because it was attempted, but because it failed, and thus left to subsequent generations the difficult problem of racial justice. Yet far too many Americans still know little or nothing about this transformative period in our history. So Hiram Revels is worth remembering today both as a pioneer of black office holding and as a refutation of outdated stereotypes. Modern research has established that far from being ignorant and impoverished field hands as portrayed by the Dunning School, the majority of black office holders in Reconstruction owned property, had access to education before or immediately after the Civil War, and many had been free before the war. Some were indeed corrupt, but no more so than white politicians of both parties in an era dubbed by Mark Twain the Gilded Age because of its less than exacting standard of political rectitude. Of course, black Reconstruction officials were almost all men of modest means. They stood in sharp contrast to the wealthy lawyers and plantation owners who dominated Southern government before the Civil War. In fact, the emergence of these men, like Revels, described, uh, the emergence of these men offers living proof of what Thomas Paine, writing about the American Revolution, described as, quote, all the extent and capacity of ordinary people, invisible in, northern, in normal times, that never fails to appear in revolutions. Rather than an ignorant former slave unfit for office, Hiram Revels, for one, was well-educated, widely traveled, and fully prepared for legislative responsibilities. But it's inconceivable that Revels and others like him could have been elevated to public office without the transformative events of the 1860s, the Civil War, emancipation, the rewriting of the Constitution, and the advent of biracial democracy in the South. To understand how this happened requires a very brief look at the unfolding of Reconstruction. Before the Civil War, slavery powerfully shaped the boundaries of the American body politic. Only a handful, uh, maybe less than five, uh, black officials existed anywhere in the country. A few justices of the peace in northern communities with strong abolitionist sentiments. On the eve of the Civil War, no person, free or slave, could be a citizen of the United States. That was what the Supreme Court decided in 1857 in the infamous Dred Scott decision. The only ones before the war who advocated a non-racial definition of American nationality were the abolitionists, white and black. They not only fought against slavery, but also for equal rights for free black Americans. Black political gatherings before the Civil War con consciously chose to call themselves conventions of colored citizens. They were claiming a citizenship that the nation denied them. They put forward a definition of citizenship based on birthright, on being born in the country, severed from the concept of race. This is what came about during Reconstruction. With the ratification in December 1865 of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which irrevocably abolished slavery, the one question of the age, one congressman declared, was settled. 
But if it resolved the fate of slavery, abolition opened a host of other issues. Was the racial inequality inseparable from slavery also being abolished? What would, it, what would be the status of the former slaves and who would determine it? What did it mean to be a free person in post-war America? These were the questions on which the politics of Reconstruction persistently turned. White Southerners had their own answers, as became clear when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson became president. Once lionized in the Dunning School as a heroic defender of the Constitution against vindictive radical Republicans, Johnson today has a strong claim to, be, uh, to being considered the worst president in American history. There are other claimants, but he is a... <laughs> He, he is a contender, let's put it that way. Um, Johnson lacked all of Lincoln's qualities of greatness. He was deeply racist, unwilling to ever change his mind, had no sense of Northern public opinion, and lacked the ability to work with Congress. Johnson set up new governments in the South in the months after the Civil War, controlled entirely by white, uh, by white men. These governments, including that of Mississippi, enacted a series of laws called the Black Codes to define the freedom African Americans now enjoyed. These laws gave blacks virtually no civil or political rights. They required all adult black men at the beginning of each year to sign a labor contract to go to work for a white employer or be deemed a vagrant and sold to someone who would pay his fine. The Black Codes alarmed the Republican Party, which controlled Congress, into thinking that the South was trying to restore slavery in all but name. Most Republicans agreed that the 13th Amendment, which freed all the slaves, um, empowered Congress to ensure, as one senator put it, that the man made free by the Constitution is a free man indeed. Congress soon passed one of the most important laws in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the first law to declare who is a free citizen of the United States and what rights they are to enjoy. The Civil Rights Act declared that all persons born in the United States, except Native Americans, who were still considered members of their tribal sovereignty, all other persons born in the country are American citizens. This is the principle of birthright citizenship, a statement that anyone can be a loyal American, race, religion, national origin do not matter, nor does the legal status of one's parents. It severs citizenship from race, as the abolitionists had long demanded. The Civil Rights Act went on to declare that all these citizens must enjoy basic legal equality. States cannot pass one set of laws for black people, as indeed they had just done, and another set for whites. The law guarantees equality of civil rights, specifically the right to sign contracts, own property, testify in court, sue and be sued. These are the rights of free labor, necessary to compete in the economic marketplace. Andrew Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Bill and it became the first important law in American history enacted over a veto. Johnson's veto message denounced the law for what today is called reverse discrimination. This is Johnson on the Civil Rights Bill. Quote, the distinction of race and color is by the bill made to operate in favor of the colored and against the white race. But of course, a law can, whoops, sorry, a law can always be repealed. So very soon, Congress put these principles and others into the 14th Amendment, the most important change in our Constitution since the Bill of Rights. Among other things, the amendment tried to address an ironic consequence of abolition. The end of slavery also ended the three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Um, under that, the, white po the free population and three-fifths of the slaves were counted in apportioning members of Congress among the states. Now, with all free, the entire black population, five-fifths would be counted, giving the southern states enhanced representation in the House of Representatives. Radical Republicans in Congress insisted that the only way to guarantee that these Southern congressmen fully respected black freedom was to give the right to vote 
to African American men. But black suffrage still remained highly controversial, and the moderate Republican, uh, the moderate majority in Congress believed the Northern public would not embrace such a departure from the long tradition of state control of voting qualifications. The result was a complicated compromise, a section which has never been enforced that deprived states of part of their representation in the House if they denied the right to vote to any group of male citizens. Thus, Mississippi, whose population then was a little over 50% black, would lose half its congressmen if it continued to deny black men the right to vote. But as I say, it was never enforced. This section also raised an outcry among the era's feminist movement because for the first time it introduced the word male into the Constitution. Unlike men, there was no penalty if states denied women, black or white, the right to vote, as all of them, of course, did at that time. But the heart of the 14th Amendment is the first section. This constitutionalizes the principle of birthright citizenship and goes on to bar states from abridging the privileges or immunities of citizens or denying to any person, citizen or immigrant, the equal protection of the law. The 14th Amendment introduces a commitment to equality into the Constitution for the first time. And the language is race neutral, which has had enormous consequences in our own time. In recent decades, the courts have used this amendment to expand the legal rights of numerous groups of Americans, most recently gay men and women seeking to marry. All in all, to borrow a phrase from the editor George William Curtis at the time, the 14th Amendment changed the consti a constitution for white men into a constitution for mankind. Encouraged by President Johnson, the all-white governments he had established in the South, except for Tennessee, ref refused by overwhelming margins to ratify the 14th Amendment. The vote in the Mississippi legislature, probably in this very room, was 115 to zero. Clearly, the principle of equal rights, regardless of race, was not easy to accept. After winning a sweeping victory in the congressional elections of 1866, Northern Republicans decided that the only way to secure both ratification of the 14th Amendment and what they called loyal government in the South was to replace the Johnson regimes which won, with ones in which African Americans enjoyed the right to vote and hold office. Thus began radical reconstruction. Black voters celebrated the winning of the right to vote, at least for men, as recognition that they were now full members of the American body politic. They flocked to the polls in remarkable numbers in Southern elections in 1867 and 1868. Over 80% of those eligible to vote cast ballots, a far higher percentage than we experience in elections today. Along with white allies, black voters elected biracial constitutional conventions, uh, which drew up new documents for the southern states based on political equality. The 15th Amendment, as I noted, soon followed, its ratification sweeping away the laws of the 17 states that still limited voting to white men. Republicans, black and white, celebrated the 15th Amendment as the triumphant conclusion of what the party leader Carl Schurz called the constitutional revolution of Reconstruction. At a gathering here in Jackson, James Lynch, Mississippi's newly elected African-American Secretary of State, a predecessor of Congressman Espy, who I think was Secretary of State here also a while ago, um, James Lynch described the amendment as both an embodiment of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and part of the worldwide spread of democracy. Nothing in all history, exclaimed the veteran abolitionist editor William Lloyd Garrison, equaled this quiet, wonderful, sudden transformation of four million hum human beings from the auction block to the ballot box. Hiram Revel's life and his brief career in the US Senate reflected this constitutional revolution. Born free in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1827, Revels was descended from ancestors as diverse as America itself. They included Native Americans, whites, and blacks. 
However, rebels enjoyed opportunities, especially extensive access to education, unavailable to most African Americans before the Civil War. His forebears, he wrote in a brief autobiographical essay, had been free as far back as my knowledge extends. He recalled that two fine colored schools existed in Fayetteville, and one of them he attended as a youth. In 1844, Revels moved to Indiana, where he received further education as the only black student in a Quaker seminary. He went on to attend another seminary in Ohio, a school in Baltimore, and, a time, and, and at a time when only a tiny number of Americans of any race attended college, uh, he studied for a year at Knox College in Illinois. Even in a society known for its migratory population, Revels before the Civil War was unusually well-traveled. Ordained a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1845, he preached as an itinerant missionary in Indiana, Illinois, and Kansas. He even ventured into the Upper South, slave states of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, hoping to bring religious instruction to slaves. His presence there sparked what he later described as a great deal of opposition. At one point, he was jailed for preaching the gospel to Negroes. Revels later claimed not to have said anything that might incite enslaved men and women to run away, but he added that when in the free states, quote, I always assisted the fugitive slave. When the Civil War broke out, Revels was working in Baltimore as an AME minister and principal of a high school for black students. In 1863, he moved to St. Louis, where he founded a school for freed slaves and, according to some accounts, helped to organize Missouri's first regiment of black Union soldiers. He appears to have come to Mississippi in 1864. He threw himself into educating the freed men and women and in 1868 became pastor of an AME church in Natchez. Revel's political career began in 1868 when Union General Adelbert Ames, the state's provisional governor, appointed him to the Natchez Board of Aldermen. Revels was soon elected here to the state Senate. Before the ratification of the 17th Amendment, in 1913, U.S. Senators were elected by the state legislatures, not by popular vote. With a large Republican majority, which included almost three dozen black members, Mississippi's lawmakers chose Ames, Governor Ames, to fill one Senate seat, which was a full term, and Revels to fill the shorter term, which, as I said, expired in one year. His election came as something of a surprise, as Revels was little known in Republican Party circles outside Natchez. Uh, John R. Lynch, as you heard, and there is a portrait of John R. Lynch on the wall back there. Uh, John R. Lynch, later a black congressman from Mississippi, uh, claimed that the invocation Revels delivered at the opening of the legislative session, which he called one of the most impressive and eloquent prayers ever delivered in the Senate chamber, made Revels a candidate for the U.S. Senate seat. But it's also true that as a presiding elder of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which he had recently left the AME to join, Revels was well known in Mississippi's black community. In any event, the black members of the legislature pressed for the elevation of one of their own uh, to uh, the Senate. The assertiveness of, blacks, of, of Mississippi's black political leadership continued throughout Reconstruction to the chagrin of many white Republicans. Revels arrived in Washington in February 1870. He received an enthusiastic welcome from the city's black community, complete with dinners in his honor, including one attended by President Grant and the members of his cabinet. The Senate's small contingent of Democrats, however, challenged Revels' right to take his seat. The Constitution requires a senator to have been a citizen for at least nine years. But black citizenship, Democrats insisted, had only been established by the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868. Before then, they said, the Dred Scott decision, which limited citizenship to whites, was the law of the land. Thus, they said, Revels fell several years short of eligibility. 
This debate, which also played out in the nation's press, took on a starkly racist tone. The New York World, the nation's leading Democratic paper, described Revels as, quote, a lineal descendant of an orangutan. Senator Garrett Davis of Kentucky claimed the Dred Scott had been correctly decided and, indeed, was still the law of the land. The Republican leader, Jacob, the Senator Jacob Howard of Michigan, declared himself nauseated by the overtly racist language and that anyone in 1870 could still invoke Dred Scott. Republicans insisted that the Reconstruction Amendments, 13, 14, and 15, not to mention Union victory in the Civil War, had nullified central parts of the pre-war legal order rooted in slavery, the disqualification of blacks from citizenship among them. On February 25th, 1870, by a vote of 48 to 8, entirely along party lines, the Senate voted to seat Hiram Revels. During his year in the Senate, Revels Rader insisted, quote, I did all I could for the benefit of my needy and much, much imposed upon people. He spoke vigorously for the reinstatement of black legislators who had been eagle, uh, illegally expelled from Georgia's General Assembly. He persuaded Secretary of War William Belknap to arrange for black mechanics to be hired for the first time at the Baltimore Navy Yard. When a bill to establish a free public school system in the nation's capital came before the Senate, Revel strenuously opposed an amendment that deleted a clause banning distinctions on account of race in school admissions. In other words, he opposed allowing the schools to become racially segregated. He spoke eloquently of the discrimination faced by blacks on railroads, streetcars, and steamboats, discrimination he and his family had experienced while traveling in Kansas before the war when they were ordered to leave the first-class railroad car. Revels condemned, quote, the prejudice in this country to color, emphasizing that blacks had, been, had done nothing to deserve it. I sometimes fear that it is on the increase, he added. We must admit that it is wrong. But the amendment passed, and the District of Columbia's school system remained segregated until the mid-1950s. When Revels was elected, the Mississippi Democratic, uh, a, a Mississippi Democratic newspaper called the result a good omen, as he belonged to the moderate wing of the Republican Party. And in fact, on the spectrum of Reconstruction politics, Revels was one of the more conservative Mississippi black Republicans. Like any senator, he introduced bills to benefit local constituents, including one calling for federal aid to rebuild Mississippi River levees damaged during the war, and another to help support the construction of a railroad in Mississippi. But these did not pass. Only one of his measures became law, a bill restoring the civil and political rights of former Confederate Army officer Arthur E. Reynolds so that he could be appointed to a judgeship by Mississippi's governor, uh, James L. Alcorn. Revels told the Senate that while violence was common in other states, blacks and whites in Mississippi were getting along harmoniously a statement that led to criticism from fellow Republicans in Mississippi, where the Klan had already made its appearance and was committing outrages. During his brief career in the Senate, Revels was in great demand as a public speaker. In the summer and fall of 1870, he embarked on an ambitious lecturing tour. Many of his speeches celebrated the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Except in Philadelphia, where the Academy of Music refused to allow him to speak in its hall, he drew large and appreciative audiences. When Revels lectured in Boston, the abolitionist Wendell Phillips said he could hardly believe that a thousand men had come to hear a senator from that race which has been so long victimized. The speaking tour proved to be quite successful and lucrative. On October 1st, 1870, Revel sent his wife a check for $3,000, an enormous sum at that time, to help the family purchase a plantation. After Revel's term expired, Governor Alcorn appointed him to head a new college for black students. Named for the governor, Alcorn State was the nation's first black land-grant institution. 
A prominent planter, Alcorn, ho had hoped to lead what he called a harnessed revolution in which black civil and political rights would be respected by prominent whites like himself, but effective political power would remain in white hands. Revel sided with Alcorn against a more radical wing of the party headed by Adelbert Ames, the ex-governor. Few black leaders or voters followed his example. With overwhelming black support, Ames was elected governor in 1873. Shortly thereafter, Revels resigned from his university presidency after Ames indicated a desire to replace him. Because of his close ties with ex-governor Alcorn, Revels, virtually alone among Mississippi's black leader, leaders, supported the Democratic campaign that overthrew Reconstruction in the state in 1875. Immediately after the election, he wrote a letter to President Grant uh, criticizing Northerners who had taken leadership positions in the Republican Party, known by their opponents as carpetbaggers. Despite the abundance of evidence that democratic political terrorism was largely responsible for the 1875 outcome, the end of Reconstruction in Mississippi, uh, Revels told a Senate investigating committee that he himself had no knowledge of acts of violence against black voters. After what Democrats called the redemption of Mississippi, Revels was reappointed president of Alcorn State. He retired in 1882. As the harsh reality of Jim Crow replaced the optimistic vision of the future embodied in Reconstruction, Revels became more and more, seemed to become more and more conservative. He was always more of a church man and an educator than a politician. He had long believed that the descendants of slavery, through no fault of their own, needed guidance from well-disposed uh, whites. Um, and in 1876, though, Revels published a protest in a religious newspaper against the Methodist Episcopal Church's plans to hold racially segregated annual conferences in the South. He warned that such a policy would damage the self-esteem of black clergymen and deprive the, quote, unavoidably poor and ignorant colored people of white religious instruction. In 1890, in this room here, I think, Mississippi's Constitutional Convention stripped the state's black population of the right to vote through ostensibly race-neutral requirements, such as payment of a poll tax and the, and the ability to provide a reasonable interpretation of the state constitution. This so-called understanding clause left the right to vote in the hands of local registrars, generally low-level Democratic Party functionaries. For good measure, the convention called for the repeal of the 15th Amendment. Some black Mississippians challenged these provisions in federal court, but the Supreme Court did not heed their pleas. Revel's response reflected his more moderate style of political leadership. He called on African Americans to seek the confidence, respect, and protection of white citizens who have the influence and power to protect them, winning their respect by their industry. This was essentially the message Booker T. Washington would articulate five years later in his celebrated speech at the Atlanta Cotton States Exposition. So Revels, I think, represents that strand of black political thought from the Reconstruction era up through the uh, era of Booker T. Washington. In his last years, Revels served as pastor of churches in Vicksburg and Holly Springs and taught school in Claiborne. He died in 1901. Two weeks later, George H. White, two weeks after his death, George H. White of North Carolina, the last black congressman of the long post-Civil War era, gave his farewell address to the House of Representatives. This is perhaps the Negro's temporary farewell to Congress, said uh, Congressman White, but let me say, Phoenix Light, he will rise up someday and come again. But the reemergence of black members of Congress did not take place for quite a while. Until Oscar de Priest's election to represent a Chicago district 28 years later, Congress remained completely white. Not until 1973, when Barbara Jordan and Andrew Young took their seats, did a former Confederate state send another African-American to the House of Representatives. 
As for the Senate, Blanche K. Bruce served one term after being elected from Mississippi in 1874. Not until nearly a century passed, in 1967, would the Senate welcome its next black member, Edward Brooke of Massachusetts. Today, the House of Representatives includes 54 black members, including two non-voting delegates. No fewer than 22 of them represent states of the old Confederacy. As for the Senate, Carol Mosley Braun, elected from Illinois in 1992, was the next after Brooke. Barack Obama and Roland Burris later succeeded her in that same Illinois seat. And William Cowan of Massachusetts served very briefly from Massachusetts. Today, for the first time in American history, the Senate has three African-American members, Cory Booker of New Jersey, Kamala Harris of uh, California, and Tim Scott of South Carolina. Scott is the first African-American senator since Revels and Bruce from a state that seceded from the Union and experienced Reconstruction. Perhaps there will be another one soon. Revel's career exemplifies important features of the Reconstruction era. Then as now, the black church and school were springboards to political careers, as with him. After Farmer, minister was the most common occupation of black Reconstruction officials, with educator not far behind. Like Revel's, many black leaders had a connection with the Union military during the Civil War. While the Reconstruction Republican Party achieved a remarkable degree of racial cooperation, the black-white alliance and relations between African Americans, Northerners, and Southern-born white Republicans was frequently fraught with tension, as in Mississippi. Like many other black Republican office holders, Revels had descendants who went on to distinction in other fields. His daughter, Susie Revels Caton, edited a newspaper for many years in Seattle, Washington. She had two sons, the sociologist Horace R. Caton, Jr., the co-author of a classic study of African-American life in Chicago, Black Metropolis, and Revels Caton, a very important West Coast labor leader. Revels' career also suggests that even after the passage of a century and a half, Reconstruction remains part of our lives today. Or to put it another way, key issues of that era remain unresolved. Who should have the right to vote? As in the late 19th century, state voter suppression laws today have denied thousands of Americans the right to cast a ballot. And I should say that it, since that is the case, the second section of the 14th Amendment ought to be enforced, taking away members of Congress for those states which are denying so many citizens the right to vote. As in the late 19th century uh, voter suppression laws, who is entitled to citizenship? This question remains highly contested. It's fought out every day on our country's borders. Indeed, last year, President Trump claimed the right to abrogate the first section of the 14th Amendment by executive order with regard to American-born children of undocumented immigrants. The public campaign a few years ago to deny the citizenship of President Obama is reminiscent of the efforts in 1870 to prevent Hiram Revels from taking his Senate seat because he was supposedly not a citizen. And in the often encountered idea that expanding the rights of non-whites somehow punishes the white majority, the ghost of Andrew Johnson still haunts our discussions of race. The greatest lesson of Reconstruction is that rights, even when inscribed in the Constitution, can never be taken for granted. If the election of Revels and hundreds like him seem to augur a permanent change in our democracy, the subsequent abrogation of those rights in the South, with the acquiescence of the rest of the nation, reminds us that to alter a celebrated observation of Martin Luther King, Jr., the arc of the moral universe does not always bend toward justice. Today, we live at a time in some ways like the 1890s, when, as Frederick Douglass complained, principles which we all thought to have been firmly and permanently settled have been boldly assaulted and overthrown. But despite the many disappointments that followed, the anniversary of the seating of Hiram Revels remains worthy of celebration as part of the long effort to purge this nation 
of the legacy of slavery. And properly remembered, Reconstruction remains an inspiration to those striving to make this a more equal, more just society. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foner. I hope you know how much it means to us to hear your words in this room on this occasion. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm honored to introduce Reverend Burden Mitchell, pastor of Zion AME Church in Natchez, to give the benediction. May we bow our words of benediction, our sending blessing, start with a prayer of thanksgiving. Eternal God, we thank you for this day that you've made. And Lord God, we have chose to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, God, for the traveling grace that you granted us as we made our way on this dreary day to this hallowed place. Then, Lord, we thank you for the words that we've heard tonight to bridge our history. And we ask God that you will continue to let them resonate in our hearts that we will move from this place doing a better job to represent all people. Now, Lord, let your grace and mercy leave this place with us. Keep our hearts and our minds stayed on you and let brotherhood remain the order of the day that when this life battle has been fought and victory won, we as a people will hear you say, servants of God, well done. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend, and thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Foner has agreed to sign, continue to sign books after the ceremony, and we do have some books left downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>